So today we're going to be turning in our Bibles once again to Matthew chapter 5. Again, this is Jesus speaking a Sermon on the Mount. So beginning with verse 27, he says, You have heard, it, heard that was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman thus commits adultery. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we've read your word, as we look deeper into it and understand what you have for us to learn through your son Jesus, that we would be uh, growing in our relationship with him, uh, growing in our relationship with you, growing in our relationship with our spouses, with one another, and Lord, that we would just continue to know your love for us and continue to know your presence here among us, Lord that we would be open to our own sins, that we would be repentant of them daily, and that we would just, as I said, continue to draw closer to you. Through Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So last week, Jesus was talking about murder. And he says that this is, you've heard it said, haven't committed murder. And of course, everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm good with that. That's, a, that's an easy A, right? That's, I can get good marks on that because I've never taken anybody's life. And Jesus says, no, you're wrong. You're wrong because... It's the hatred, the anger that's within your hearts that convicts you of this, that, that, that testifies to who you truly are. And so it wasn't as easy as they thought it was. Now, of course, today our message title is Easy A, but we're not talking about a grade. And although in, in my Bible and in, in many Bibles, I think, that you have the headers of adultery and divorce concerning these sections, it's not adultery that we're talking about either. The easy A that I'm talking about is the, the addiction that is behind the adultery and much of the divorce. And that's the sexual addiction. See, when Jesus is talking, he says the word adultery. And in the Greek that's used here, it's, it's moi kuo. And, but there's a, if you look at the subjugant, they use a, a, a similar word, similar meaning. But it's a different word, and it's very revealing. It's pornaya. And either way, though, it refers to extramarital intercourse as well as all immoral sexual acts. Now, all sexual acts that are immoral, what does this mean? And I've had people tell me, they say, well, Jesus doesn't directly address the topic of homosexuality. He doesn't say this. He doesn't talk about it and say that it's a sin. Okay, you can make that argument. But that argument doesn't hold water because this is what Jesus says. Jesus reiterates what God has already established time and time again. And that is that all sex outside of marriage is considered to be immoral. All sex outside of marriage is considered to be immoral. And God also established, and again, Jesus reaffirms that marriage is between one man and one woman. So now I'm a big fan of Winnie the Pooh, and Winnie the Pooh is considered to be a bear of little brain. But even Winnie the Pooh, the bear of little brain, could piece this together and say, okay, marriage is one man, one woman, and all sex outside of marriage is immoral. Thus, Jesus really did actually address homosexuality, bestiality, uh, infidelities, uh, adultery, obviously, he's talking about it here. Pedophilia, he talks about all these things. He encompasses everything that is sexually immoral in so many ways. Just this broad picture. So we don't technically say homosexual, homosexuality in the Bible. We don't technica, technically say pedophilia in the Bible. You're right. But he puts it under a broad umbrella and says, this is what is morally acceptable. This is what is right. Everything else outside of that is wrong. And those things fall under that category. And so Jesus is talking about adultery here, but he's talking about what's leading to the adultery. 
He's saying if you're looking at a man or a woman, he says woman, but it falls on all of us. He's speaking to all of us. He just knows that men have a tendency to be a little more visual. We're a visual creature. And so he says if you look at someone else and you have lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. Now, the typical dress for both male and female of the day in, in Jesus' time was pretty conservative. So usually it would be very difficult to look at someone and say, ooh, check them out, look at their form, right? Because they were wearing things that weren't very revealing. And those that were wearing very revealing outfits, they were doing so for a purpose. They were using sex or sexuality for gain. They wore clothing that would act as a billboard of sorts to say, hey, look at me, look what I have to offer you. Look what you can have for the right price. And this idea of wearing revealing clothing in order to advertise oneself or one's services has prevailed throughout the millennia. It becomes more and more obvious as you go through the, through the millennia, through the time, the years, and to see who it is that's offering up themselves. But then all of a sudden it starts to blur. The line begins to blur. Someone recently had, uh, made a comment that it's... They, they, they probably wouldn't recognize division is an avenue that, that is uh, areas of division, that is an area that uh, is, is well known throughout the history of, of Grand Rapids of being a, a, an area that is worked uh, by prostitutes, essentially. And, and the comment was made that if they went down division nowadays, they, they would be less likely to recognize a prostitute on the street. And that's because what people are wearing more and more is falling into the same category as what prostitutes would typically wear. It's becoming more and more revealing. I think that the prostitutes of Jesus' day, the people that wore very revealing clothing, again, male and female, they would probably blush at what is becoming acceptable in our society. Because it's no longer advertising. See, we rebrand everything, right? Everything gets rebranded. We know that God's uh, covenant with, with Noah and, and, the, and the rainbow, that was rebranded in our recent history. We know that, that, that truth is being rebranded. We know that sex and sexuality and gender, that's all being rebranded. Well, what we're wearing and how we're advertising ourselves is being rebranded because now it's not, re it's not branding. We're not advertising ourselves. Instead, we're just expressing ourselves. We have the right to express ourselves, right? Except we're becoming more and more provocative in our dress. And we're revealing more and more. It's becoming acceptable. It's so much more acceptable than it ever was. And so we're looking at one another. We're seeing things that we really shouldn't be seeing on a regular basis. And it's creating this, this addiction, this sexual addiction. We're having thoughts of lust or even just sexual curiosity. Oh, I wonder, hmm, that's kind of revealing. And some things aren't even, they, they leave nothing to the imagination. But it's, Jesus is revealing that it's these thoughts themselves as much as the act that is adultery because it starts in our hearts and we we talk about this this word i mentioned pornaya this is the heart of porn it's where the word comes from and remember it's any immoral sexual act and we automatically think when we think of sexual addiction we think of porn right it's a huge huge industry that feeds our sexual addictions but it's not even the largest industry that feeds our sexual addiction Actually, and that's one of the, that's kind of a taboo. It's still somewhat taboo to, to be uh, looking at porn, participating in that. But it's not as, uh, it's not nearly as taboo anymore. But the crazy thing is, is that the largest industry that feeds us is, is our celebrity coverage. And I'm not singling out celebrities, but they do receive far more coverage than your average person. But... For example, I look on my news feed on my phone, I get a random news feed, and it comes up with sports and 
fashion and, and politics and economics. It comes up with a lot of things. And any of the feeds centering around or mentioning celebrities or big names, the subject lines have several things in common. They talk about what the people are wearing, regardless of what the topic is, what the actual, uh, what the actual headline is, what the actual uh, news feed is about. It talks about what they're wearing, and they like to sensationalize things. So you see words like revealing, daring, sheer, in order to describe what they're wearing. There's a, 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 an ad, a regular uh, random feed that comes through that's specific to footwear. It's talking about shoes, and yet before it gets to the actual uh, descriptive of the shoe, it's talking about what they're wearing, and it's using many of these previous descriptives that we've already said. Whether it's celebrity watch lists, social media sites, even your local news, they, they talk about what these big names are wearing as much as what they're actually doing or saying. And it's becoming more and more commonplace. It has become the modern equivalent of the old Sears lingerie catalog. But the thing is, is the Sears lingerie catalog, there was a, nothing really wrong with that. You know, it, it was delivered to homes. You could get it in the store. It, was, it wasn't uh, pornography. But when young boys would get a hold of this Sears lingerie catalog, People recognized it for what it was, and they would say, no, 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 you can't have that. We need, to, we need to take that away from you, because they realized, they recognized that it was feeding a sexual addiction. They recognized that it was creating thoughts, it was promoting thoughts within their heads, and it was causing sin to creep into their heart. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing this in all of these new news feeds, and the reason I say that it's larger than the porn industry and it's having a greater effect than the porn industry is because it's infinitely more accessible. And it's seen as everyday reading, as harmless. Yet the images that are revealed in these, in these news feeds are often far more revealing than anything you would have ever seen in the Sears lingerie catalog. But again, it's just normal, right? But... The celebrities, and I talk about the celebrities because, again, they receive more coverage than the average person, and they seemingly try to push the envelope of decency because they need to be recognized, right? We need to sell ourselves. Again, it's advertising, but it's not advertising. It's just expressing oneself. But when you take 100 celebrities and you put them at a, an award ceremony or a Met Gala, for example, you get the proof in any of these, if you put 100 celebrities together and they want to be standing out among their peers, they need to do something extreme. And so they do. They push that envelope of decency further and further to the point where it's on the verge of being utterly destroyed. You see proof of it on all these things. And they're just, they want to get the attention. And so they wear things like, oh, what are you wearing to, the, to this award ceremony? I think I'm just going to wear it for a top. I'm going to wear a necklace. It just covers the, you know, the, the sensitive pit bits. You know, that's, that's what we're going to do. And that's what is happening. People are wearing things that are more and more revealing. And, and this is very difficult for us because it's simply feeding these sexual addictions. It, it's, it's very true for men. Men are very visual, generally more visual than women. But it applies for women as well. You know, women get a bad rap oftentimes because they, they wear clothing that is so revealing. Even if it's covering all the skin, it's skin tight. It's created that way on purpose. And people say, well, it's the patriarchy. You know, it's men designing the clothes. The problem is, is that the female designers are designing clothes that are just as revealing, if not more so. And so we can't put it on one person or another. We can't put it on one group or another. It's all of us. We're all active participants. And as I said, men are more visual. We tend to be more visual. And so this sexual addiction is easier to feed us. But it's just as much of a problem. It's just as problematic with women as well. Because the same thoughts that men have when we see a woman in a revealing outfit are the same thoughts that women have when they see a man. Especially if he's well chiseled, you know, abs and, and, and chest, and, and that is revealed. He's not wearing a shirt or a see-through or open. They have the same thoughts. It feeds the same thoughts. Or if he's wearing something that is very tight-fitting. They have the same thoughts. It's fed by this, by this uh, 
these visuals and it's feeding this, this sexual addiction and it's just continuing to push and it's continuing to go further and further. And so it applies as much to women as it does to men. And, and now that society is pushing for anything goes in bed or marriage, these temptations are dragging down even more and more people. And this is what Jesus is trying to reveal. He's trying to reveal that the, just looking at someone and lusting in your heart, that's a sexual addiction that is at the core of it, at the root of it. And that's what's causing this. It's what's dragging us into sin further and further. And so then he gets to this seeming extreme, right? And then we get to verse 29. He says that you need to gouge out your eye or chop off your hand. And many see this, many outside the church and even some within the church, they, they see this as crazy talk. They're like, wow, this is insane. You know, these people, these Christians are nuts. This is what they believe. You got to gouge out your eye or chop off your hand. And, and they see this as the extremism of religion. And so they turn away from it. And the, and the sad part is, is that the commentators, the majority of the commentators, they'll talk about verse 27. They'll talk about verse 28, but the majority of them will skip over verse 29 entirely. They'll just completely omit commentaries for, the, for that verse because they don't want to touch it. Because they're missing the point of this. Jesus is speaking, as he's often wanted to do, in hyperbole. He's, yes, he's trying to get your attention to make a point. You need to understand that it's hyperbole, that it's extreme, to get you to look and to focus on what matters. It impresses the importance of being aware of how the little things can lead to the destruction of the whole. Your eye can lead to the destruction of your entire body. Your hand can lead to the destruction of your entire body. And people say, this is crazy. And yet, I want to see a poll done throughout our nation. I want to see someone ask the public, would you give up an eye or a hand in order to maintain that hold, that access to your phone and to the internet? In order to have your phone and the internet, you have to give up an eye or you have to give up a hand. Would you be willing to do that? And the sad part is, is I think that there are too many people, and even if it's one, it's too many, there are too many people that would agree to these terms. So Jesus is saying that you need to give up these things in order to keep yourself from destruction, and yet people are willing to hold on to these things, and they're willing to give up. So how are we saying this is extreme? When people, I think, would be willing to go through with this. And that leads us into divorce. Jesus goes into divorce, and he says that, uh, and he follows one school of thought that's kind of an extreme. He says that divorce is allowed based off of sexual immorality or infidelity. That was one extreme of thought. The other extreme of thought is where we're at today is at will divorce. It's for any reason or no reason at all. And Jesus says it's only for sexual immorality or infidelity. And, and, and that's, that's what he's saying. So it's one extreme, and, and people really didn't like that extreme. They liked the ability to, 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 do, to get a divorce as they wanted to. But Jesus also, by revealing our hearts and saying that we... Are, are committing adultery by, by looking at another person or looking at someone with lust in our hearts. We're committing adultery. Basically, in our society today, he's really saying that most people would be able to justify divorce on these very extreme grounds. Now, how crazy is that, that we've fallen, in, fallen into the situation where this is acceptable, these addictions, the sexual addiction is the heart of adultery. And it's the leading cause for divorce. But Jesus, again, he points back to the heart as the source of our sins. That what separates us from God and in truth separates us from one another comes from within our hearts. How we're acting, how we're thinking comes there. Now Jesus isn't condoning. He's saying that this is the extreme. But hey, guess what? You all fall under this. The majority of you fall under this, so you can be justified in your divorce. He's not condoning the slew of divorces that happens on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Rather, he's pointing to our hearts that we would recognize the lust for others in them and turn from it. And we ought to have lust in our hearts, but that lust in our hearts should be for our spouse and for them alone. We're going to have eyes for our for our spouse alone, to be looking at them 
and seeing the beauty in them to feeling the attraction to them alone. That's what Jesus is trying to say when he's talking about this. He's getting back to the fact that we need to look at the little things. See, this is yet another call to examine our heart and to consider our ways and to go back to what is important, to re-examine who we are, how we think, not just what we've done. So what? You haven't committed murder. So what? You haven't committed adultery. You still have. Because you've done it in your hearts. So this is our opportunity to look within, to examine ourselves and to see where we are at as individuals and where we are at in our relationship with God, with Jesus, and one another. Next week we're going to continue in our studies in chapter 5 of Matthew. For now, we will close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for bringing us together today for this message that you have brought through me. And Lord, I pray that all within the sound of my voice are, are convicted of their sins, of, that we would look within our hearts, that we would recognize and understand how the things that we're looking at, the things that we're seeing, how they are affecting our lives, more importantly, our relationships our relationship with you, your son Jesus, with our spouse, with our neighbors. Lord, I pray that we are more diligent to walk in your ways and to understand that sin that is within us, to lift it to you and to be constantly asking for forgiveness and constantly moving forward towards you. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.